Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Readiness Institute Speaker Series. My name is Justin Alley. I'm the Executive Director of the Readiness Institute. I'm joined today by our Program Manager, Emma Hans. In the Readiness Institute, our goal and our mission is to enable education, industry, and community partners to coordinate, collaborate, and create experiences for learners to achieve community and future readiness. And we are here today, season two, episode one, and we're so thrilled to be here today to talk about better decisions, better lives by our friend, Dan. Dan, welcome to the speaker series. How are you? Thank you, Justin. Yeah, great to be here and looking forward to this. Thank you, Dan, so much. And Dan, to kind of get everyone to know who you are and what you do, can you explain a little bit about your personal and professional pathway and how you got to where you are today. Okay, glad to. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of an overview and try to weave in a little bit of the decision-making aspects even into that. So I, I grew up on a Midwestern farm, learned a lot there about resourcefulness and just the value of hard work. I had um, I'd selected my college major by junior year in high school, which is probably sort of unusual and, and stayed with it. And it was geology, and that was really based on kind of looking at sort of the, the fit with my aptitude and interests for science, as well as kind of looking at the different types of careers in the different science fields and so forth. So I did stay with that. I uh, went on through college, and uh, as I finished college uh, with getting a degree in geology, I was at that point, uh, I planned kind of all along, expected I'd need to get a graduate degree for kind of the professional jobs I was interested in. And I hadn't yet decided between geology, hydrology, and which is water science and agronomy or soil science would be a fit kind of between geology and, and my farm background. And um, had opportunity, I'd graduated a little early, so I had a few months to get a job and I actually got a geology job so I could try out that a little bit more decided on going to uh, University of Wyoming for a grad degree in geology. And that decision was based on just sort of quality of the program, uh, the geology of Wyoming, uh, a fellowship offer, and uh, the fact that it was in Denver recruiting territory. And I then uh, ended up accepting a job in Denver before I graduated and uh, started my career there in a kind of exploration geology position. So. And that probably all sounds very sort of uneventful and scripted and, and all, um, but there definitely were some decisions and course corrections and, and uh, surprises along the way. And I think, you know, most significantly, I wouldn't be talking with you now if I hadn't 15 years into that geology career decided to, to change course and uh, move over into the business side. And I picked up an MBA working part time again to kind of build some credentials in in business and, and try out my my interests there. And uh, fortuitously, just as I was sort of coming out of that, my the employer I'd been with for 15 years was starting to staff up a a new function called decision analysis. So, and it's my 20 years doing that that have really led me here today. Um, with just experience as a global decision consultant and decision skills instructor. Um, and so that's what I sort of post-career elected to sort of invest my time to volunteer teaching youth decision skills as well as helping nonprofits with that. Well, Dan, thanks a lot for that journey because your journey today and your journey in the past has impacted a lot of youth uh, across the country, but specifically at the Readiness Instant, our summer program, as you know, you were very instrumental in incorporating a decision skills process to our learners in the summertime because our summer programs geared towards making uh, all learners who come to us, high school students, be successful in life no matter what they pursue in post-secondary life, colleges and careers. And it's important to give them the skills they need to be successful no, no matter what they do in life. And so when I learned about decision-making skills and I've learned more about who you are and what you do, I was like, yes, we need to teach this. We need to teach decision-making skills. You have a great process and you not just help change the lives of so many students we serve, but really change the attitudes of the, Red the attitude of the readiness Institute. Um, because every point you go to in life, no matter if it's 
asking someone out on a date, um, asking for the car, asking for anything. Mm -hmm. There are decisions you have to make. And sometimes if you give people the tools and the resources, they can help make those decisions better for themselves and ultimately to help other people. So uh, Dan, can you take a few minutes to explain uh, the decision-making process, what it is, and why is it so important to know and to yeah, learn? Yeah, yeah. Now, first of all, uh, kudos to you, Justin, for uh, taking me up on my interest. You were very open when I reached out, and that's that doesn't happen with everyone. I know I've found, uh, of course, educators, everybody's busy. They've got other things to think about. They might know, you know kind of wonder, what's, what's this about? And do I really have time to bother? But you, you were open and enthusiastic, supportive from the beginning. So I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, so decision making. I mean, what I like to tell students is basically, you know, decisions, decision skills are really a key means of enhancing your your opportunity, your choices and your outcomes in, in life. And um, and basically not just I use the analogy of being on the road of life, turning through life and say, don't just be a passenger, don't just set it on autopilot, but take the wheels, you know, look ahead towards where you would like to go, give some real thought to where, where, do, where do you want to end up and then, you know, be more intentional about your choices along the way in terms of how best to get there. And as you say, it does have broad applicability. Uh, you know, not just business, but school and, and lots of personal decisions from purchase decisions to relationships to, to lots of other choices. But um, I think maybe I'll go to a I'll go to a slide here, if that's OK. That would be several, wonderful. Just, that would be just wonderful. To, to help illustrate. OK, let's share a screen. There we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Dan. And, and I appreciate this because this is what uh, our students learn this summertime. A lot of the things we're going to hmm. be sharing here. And what I loved about all of this was the fact that it was so uh, it was so easy to follow, but it was also gave uh, our students confidence. And for those who are listening right now, uh, uh, we asked the students at the end of the year, 45 high school students, what decision uh, skill did they learn um, and what uh, what it meant for them and tell us more about it. And so we're going to be making a podcast on this, talk about mm -hmm. what students learn from this as well. So uh, yeah, thank you for sharing this screen with us. Okay, welcome. Yeah, and this I mean, this is just an example because I think a lot of people say, well, I, I make, and people do make decisions every day, dozens of decisions, maybe hundreds of uh, big and small decisions. Um, and they wonder, you know, why well, I can just kind of go with my gut, go with my intuition. But the problem is there are lots of what we call decision traps out there. And I know I'm not going to speak to each of these, but um, these are these are some pretty common ones. And I'll, and I'll just you know mention a few as an example. You know, the third one there being in a compromised decision state. So if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, acronym HALT, <laughs> don't make an important decision in that state. And I've added to that sort of impaired, as in substance impaired, because if, if if you're substance impaired, then you're not necessarily in any position to make a decision. Others may be making decisions for you that aren't in your best interest and so forth. So, so just saying there are lots of obstacles to good decision-making out there. We, uh, we, call, we call that in our family when we blend the first two, we always say we're hangry and that's why um, we act how we yeah, act yeah. and make decisions. <laughs> how we, especially driving in the car, we start making, get off this exit, do this, we're hangry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 true. Um, Another one here is, you know, getting prematurely attached to a specific course of action. So the example I use with high schoolers often, it's so relatable in current form, is kind of what next after high school. And um, and a lot of them are sort of already attached to, I have to get into Sanford, or I have to get into this specific school, or <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. And... Um, so I try to encourage them just step back, really think about kind of why, what is it you're really accomplishing? That's a means to some bigger, bigger objective. And think about, you know, the, again, where you really want to go and and other alternatives in terms of how to get there and and then and then work it through. Um, but there are a number of these and things that, that students tend to trip over and, and, and they, they do relate well to lots of these. And, and we can come up with a number of different situations in high school 
that they face where you can, many of these multiple ones will apply, could apply to that same decision situation. Uh, but in terms of the actual decision process, I guess maybe I'm just, just more getting to the heart of your question, I think. Yeah, um, no, this is great. Now, this is great because <laughs> before you make decisions, there's, you know, like you said, there's there's signs and I love the, the road signs you have there because yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's the, the root cause of why you're making a decision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't want to fall in these pits. And so often we think prematurely, like, oh, we need to do something and go for our gut. And um, sometimes that's we need to start by understanding there are pitfalls. So this is this mm -hmm. is actually perfect. And this is why. We wanted you on the speaker series because you are the expert in this, and this is perfect. This makes perfect sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, so a little more than on decisions. So, I mean, the thing about decisions is often they are challenging, um, at least the more complicated consequential decisions, and um, and things can get in the way of those. Um, and in some cases, you won't know the outcomes for weeks, months, maybe even years, know the full outcome of those. So what might we do kind of while in the midst of the decision, sort of a leading indicator rather than a lagging indicator? That's where we've got these concepts of decision quality, sort of these six dimensions. So as people are in the midst of a decision, just to kind of think through this checklist of sorts saying, you know, in terms of the frame, do I do I understand, Am I am I addressing the right problem? <laughs> Do I understand the context, the scope of this opportunity, what it's about, the issues, the objectives? Do Do I understand, you know, what I want and don't want out of this and how I can sort of measure those? Um, am I clear about the decisions before me and the alternatives for those? Do I have creative, compelling alternatives in play? Um, do, I, do I understand the information that I need to know in order to, to characterize those alternatives. And is it relevant? Is it reliable? Is it trustworthy? You know, reasoning, have I taken that information and applied it in a logically correct way? Am I, am I learning, getting insights into which alternatives best meet my, my objectives? Am I tying that all, this, all, all these considerations together? And finally, there needs to be alignment and commitment to go forward, particularly if there are multiple people involved in that decision and, and stakeholders. So and, and if we do these, these are a way of kind of gauging and enhancing. Out of these six right here, because they're all fascinating, which one do you sometimes want to focus more attention to? Does that depend on the person, the situation, or is there one that kind of stands out more than the other ones? Yeah, they're all important, and we kind of talk about like links on a chain. So the weakest yeah. link, you know, determines the strength of the chain. So we want them all to be at a level where um, additional work and information really wouldn't change our decision. Okay. But I would say one that often gets overlooked more is just not spending enough time up front on objectives. What do I really want? And again, not just saying, yeah, I want to get to this school, but why? Keep asking why, why is it? What's the higher level? What are you trying to achieve by do, going there or doing that? That makes sense. Uh, is a key, yeah. So, um, okay. Um, and I can get, would you like me to get into, I've got a few steps in terms of please, what I yeah, suggest. Please, yeah, please, yes. Yeah, this, okay. I love this. I'll, uh, and I know people watching, that. They, you okay. know, they're very interested in watching and learning about this as well. So in, in the decision process, I mean, there are lots of tools in the toolbox, many tools, and uh, but if I sort of pick the core, kind of getting into the heart of it, um, I think it relates to your prior question too, is kind of starting up front with, yeah, your values and objectives, what do you want and don't want, give that some thought, um, then think about, identify what are the decisions out there um, that are part of this. Maybe there's some decisions that are already made or have been made for you, and these are givens you need to work within, but of those that remain, which are in your scope, and, and what are the alternatives for those? Again, kind of put put some time into more consciously coming up with, oh, if, if I didn't do that, what else might I try? What other school might I consider? What other career, what other, what other model phone might I consider? Whatever it happens to be. And then, you know, in this progression, 
you get to the criteria and say, well, okay, I've identified some alternatives. How am I going to decide what would cause me to prefer one alternative over mm -hmm. another, one phone over another, one extracurricular activity over another? Uh, those become your criteria or value measures. And then you can kind of compare those alternatives, you know, linking back to your objectives and so forth and say, you know, which of these alternatives gives me the most of what I really care about and want. And the action step then is kind of bringing that all together. And, and I do have one example and examples I think are much more effective than, than just words. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll just go right on and close. Is that okay? Yes, yes, please, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this is just an example of one decision tool, which I find, you know, very, very helpful. And um, kind of here, here are these five kind of core steps I've talked about. So in this particular example, the decision maker is a college senior. The decision is career target. And what this table is doing for us is it's helping us compare the alternatives and columns here relative to a variety of value measures. So here are three, three alternatives for career target, finance manager, math teacher, data analyst, data scientist. And, and then here are six value measures sort of criteria that they consider important. So in that case, kind of the action step is go fill in the blanks, you know, get, get relevant, reliable information with which to characterize each alternative relative to each of these considerations. And then you can just sit back and look at it. And the ultimate objective is insights around, you know, if we're seeking clarity, clarity of action, kind of what direction to go, seeking confidence through decision quality and tools like this kind of help help you see the big picture where you can step back and say all things considered and, um, you know, consider potential trade-offs, you know, am I willing to give up a little salary for a little flexibility or location okay. preference, think, things like that. So that's just an illustration of how you could take these concepts and use them to kind of help bring to to clarity again our ultimate goal is clarity of action and dan this is a great example and i thank you for this because one of the questions i was going to ask and you provided a, a great example of illustrations is what's a great example of decision making where can you apply it and i remember one time in the summertime we were going all the different decision making processes and skills and tools and we asked the students a question. We had them, we put salary, location, growth opportunities, culture, diversity. We put all these sides around the room. We had students ask a question. You know, when you, uh, when you get a job, what's one of these areas that are most important to you and why? And they had to go stand next to them. We had these questions around them. And we would ask them questions. Why did you pick that? And they would actually reference some of the decision-making skills that you just referenced in their decision-making. And then they actually changed their mind after they went back and, and went through the process of, okay, why did I pick this? Oh, because salary, I just wanted the most money. Well, hold on. If I go over the culture, then I can have great growth opportunities to make more money rather than just starting out in the salary that I want it. Maybe there's, if I want it, the most money, maybe this route will be a better option than me. So it was fascinating to see their minds trigger through the different um, processes and, 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 and the, and the um, scaffolding that had to go through to make that decision. So this is a great example. Thank you so much for sharing it. And if someone wanted to learn more and get some resources, I know you have a lot of resources out there to get information, what would be a great point of reference? And I believe you have a slide to talk about yeah. resources as well. Yeah, I'll get to that here. Okay, yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, and the good, good news is that there are several organizations um, that provide decision education resources. And in most cases, these are sort of free. They're, they're out on their websites and so forth. Um, and some also provide some, you know, some educator instructor training and decision skills. As well, so I'll just uh, yeah mention mention these briefly here. So, Decision Education Foundation they've been around for over 20 years. They've got lots of resources just available off their their own website as well as on YouTube. Uh, Chris Spetzler is the um, director of the DEF, and uh, just to, yeah, sort of a shout out to Chris. He's been very supportive, very great to work with. 
I draw upon a lot of their resources to kind of supplement what I use when I'm teaching. And uh, and, and so, I'll, uh, I'll second that. DEF has been a great partner of the Readiness Institute, thanks to you. And not only are the materials and online resources are very valuable, but the, the videos to go along with the, the skills and resources are very relevant that we use a lot of the, we used all their videos, in fact, to help. And they're short, they're to the point, they're very interactive, but I also appreciate the fact that they had hard copies of the, the skill process. So students were able to go through on a weekly basis and document and show the work that they were doing and work with their mentor on this. So I second DF, um, if you're not familiar with it, highly recommend uh, to shout out again to, I know you gave a shout out to Chris, but Chris and his team, because they, they gave us the, the tools that we needed to use in order to make an impact for the students we serve and the communities that they serve. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to mention Delta Learns. So that's a collaboration between some decisions and scientists and, and some educators. And, and they've got their own site with a lot, a lot of good resources. And, and in some cases, you know, an educator and not a lot of decision analysts, but an educator sort of taken these and put together learning plans that people can, you know, insert and, in, you know, right into, into a class. And one of the challenges I find in, in kind of getting opportunities is People say, well, decision skills, I mean, they don't really quite fit in language arts or quite fit in math or history, at least traditionally, even though you know, communication is very important, there are mathematical concepts and so forth, but where do we fit it? And so some of the better opportunities have been where schools have kind of a life skills program or a journey hour elective or, or it could be a lunchtime kind of brown bag thing or a Saturday morning, maybe through counseling sort of decision workshop things like that, but um, anyway, but Delta Learns, they, they have created some lesson plans that somebody could within a language arts or within um, some of the other other standard curriculum insert those. So that's that's definitely worth a look. And then the Alliance for Decision Education is out there and it says it's kind of bringing some of these together and they do reference these other groups. And then I'll just mention, I put my an email address here. If, if somebody does want to contact me, you know, I'm happy to give you a little coaching guidance or direct you to the right resources or do what I can to help. You know, it's all it's all as a volunteer um, and just happy to make connections or you know, to assist in, in whatever way I can. Well, Dan, we cannot thank you enough. And we took the, Dan up on that offer and he actually... <laughs> helped kick off our Readiness Institute summer program event this summertime and had an opportunity to kick off the decision-making uh, tool set that we released to the students this summertime by setting the stage up for them and then working weekly on this. And so, Dan, I, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone we serve here in Pittsburgh and Readiness Institute and throughout Pennsylvania because you have made such an impact on the, the people we serve, the learners we serve, but more importantly, the communities that they serve. And so a lot of people are benefiting from your expertise in decision-making. That's why it's decision-making, um, uh, changing lives and better lives, better decisions, better lives because of this effort. Um, Dan, to close out here, do you have anything that you would like to share with anyone listening who or who will listen to this recorded webinar when it's released? on um, kind of closing statements on decision-making and something that you want to share with everyone as a, as a last word uh, as we wrap up here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess one thing that comes to mind is uh, we often speak of this sort of process as a conversation to clarity. So we just kind of like the concept. I mean, this is not something, conversation means there are others involved conversation means there's uh, to clarity there's a progression there's a goal in that and uh, so I just you know encourage these I think they're helpful just as an as a communication tool to kind of help people again align and work towards understanding um, you know I mentioned I use the example of what next after high school with students and that resonates with them uh, in some ways the parents get even more enthusiastic I've done a couple for high school parents and they're they're excited about having 
tools to take back to have a more structured conversation with their with their their student and better understand kind of what's important to that student, what are their objectives, help them think through choices, help them think through trade-offs. So so I think that's a big part of it. It's it's uh, tended to be you know a, an interactive communication process of, of learning. Great. Thank you so much, Dana. If anybody on the chat right now or listening uh, has any questions, please feel free to add those in the chat or Q&A. But I know that we will get a lot of people who, we, who will be watching this once it's posted on their recording. And we want to thank you, Dan, and thank the people who tuned in live today for this. And I loved your closing thoughts there. Dan, I truly appreciate it. I do hope people reach out to you. Um, we will continue to use the decision-making process in all of our programs at the Readiness Institute, because again, we think it's a value that students can uh, use no matter what they want to pursue in any career or in their personal, public, or professional life as well. So Dan, I don't think we have any questions here live right now, but I want to take this moment and especially thank you for coming on here. Thank you for your wonderful partnership and what you do for youth and for communities. I'd like to also thank Emma for um, setting up the webinar today. I truly appreciate everything that you do with the Readiness Institute. And, uh, and Dan, thank you. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And if you want to learn more about the Readiness Institute or watch the recording of this webinar, we will be posting it on all of our social media feeds, feeds but you can also visit readinessinstitute.com psu.edu. If you want to listen to this, please check on our speaker series uh, segments, and please also go back and listen to our other speaker series shows that we had in the past in season one. So I could not think of a better way to kick off season two than do it with you, Dan. So thank you so much. Thank you, Justin and Emma. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you on season two episode two next thank you